So anyway, Ed, uh, as Jerry uh, had mentioned, and as was advertised, uh, the title of this uh, presentation is Using Risk and Opportunity Assessment in the Strategic Planning Cycle. And uh, <clears throat> it's just a half hour uh, presentation, so we're really not going to get into things in uh, a lot of great detail, although we're going to touch on a lot of things. And it's really surrounding strategic planning, uh, uh, the strategic planning cycle and how to do strategic planning, but it's introducing other variables as well. So <clears throat> because we're going to be looking at a lot of different things about strategic planning, there are really three key points that I think I'll, I'll you know, I want people to kind of uh, remember as we're going through this. One is we're talking about a strategic planning cycle along with uh, an introduction to a methodology. Uh, the second thing is uh, we're going to be using risk and opportunity ratings to actually prioritize the results of the strategic planning uh, meetings. <clears throat> and the third thing is at least eight elements of ISO 9000 uh, will be, there will be at least eight elements of ISO 9001 that you'll be uh, helping to meet. So uh, just by doing this one process, you capture a lot of the requirements of the ISO 9001 uh, standard. And when I say ISO 9001 standard, I also mean the other standards that uh, go along the same, uh, <coughs> using the same criteria with the, the basic elements uh, in the other uh, international standards, like health and safety, like environments, like security, et cetera. So the last time that I uh, did a presentation for Close Reach was last November, and that was sort of a narrative style. Uh, and then there were any questions that were asked at the end. But this time around, I just invite everybody uh, that if you do have a question, uh, just pipe up and we can uh, we can take them as we go along. Okay. Yeah. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, we're also going to be talking about uh, uh, strategic planning methodology, but not in great detail. And the one that I'm going to introduce is called the balanced scorecard. Now, uh, strategic planning method, strategic planning itself has been around, like been in the forefront since the 1960s. Not to say that the, you know, strategic wasn't practiced by some people before then, but it really came to the forefront in the 1960s. But it wasn't really until maybe the late 1980s or the 1990s that they really looked at anything else when they got together besides money uh how how to make more money and that's it you know what were the different objectives that we would set to make ourselves more money make more sales do this do that and it was pretty well uh, almost a one-dimensional look-see so along came a couple of people a couple of fellows from uh, harvard and they developed a methodology called the balance scorecard where they stated you know, you should look at a little bit more than just money. And in fact, if you look at things in this way, each at as, as far as levels go, if you start with this bottom level, whatever you do down there, whatever, whatever objectives you set to improve yourself at this level will help the next level. And then whatever objectives you, you uh, set to help that next level, it, it's almost like it's, it's doubling the strength that's going to help the next level, and so on and so forth. As you can see in this, uh, uh, this picture, down at the bottom, it talks about employee skills and attitude. Well, if you focus objectives down there and you grow stronger as far as your employee base, it's going to help you at that next level, which is the creation and uh, uh, the fulfillment of whatever quality products and services you have uh, and, and whatever you're producing for your customer. And if you can build on that, then it's going to cause the customer to become you know, more satisfied, more loyal. And if you have more loyal customers and more satisfied customers, business pretty well just comes to you. And that's the whole reason behind the balance scorecard. So I just wanted to bring that up because uh, even though I'm going to be talking about the steps of strategic planning, uh, 
this is a way to take those steps and, and really make it good for your organization. Okay. So this next slide actually kind of lays out uh, the steps for a strategic planning cycle. And we're going to be going through uh, uh, these steps in more detail through the rest of the presentation. So uh, if you take a look at it, you get steps one to nine, and uh, actually uh, the shading right now, don't worry anything about the shading. It just shows that you're getting closer to your goal, which is the completion of the uh, strategic planning cycle, and that's all it means. But the, the actual, uh, when you get together with your management team or whatever team you have to to brainstorm what objectives you should have and, and uh, what actions you should take to help meet those objectives, et cetera, et cetera. That's kind of surrounded by a, uh, uh, a rectangle box, if you notice from uh, steps two to seven. But the first step is to gather data. Uh, and after the data, we get together and we do uh, a SWOT analysis, we assess uh, the risk and opportunities coming from the SWOT analysis, we create the objectives, we select the measurement methods, we determine the baselines and targets, and we plan the actions. And that kind of simplifies all of the steps of the strategic planning. You'll see a big money bag down at the bottom where it says, uh, just underneath 8 and 9, where it says approved budget. Now, depending upon how long your budget process is, you'll want to do this in turn to be able to feed into your budget process because whatever objectives you come out of with uh, your strategic planning sessions, you'll want to have some money to be able to go do it. And that means that when you start planning your actions, you need to uh, determine how long, how much, uh, how many resources, how much money is actually going to take to uh, fulfill them. So you'll want to do it in in line with your budget process. OK. Any questions on that one? Nope. Now, just one thing I'll, I'll mention uh, with the steps to strategic planning, uh, you'll notice that it's done well in uh, in advance of the fiscal year that it's going to represent. A lot of that has to do with, you know, it, it's better to plan before you take the steps. Otherwise, you're going to be scurrying, but it also has to do with you want to do it in line with your budgeting. Okay. But when you're finished with this cycle and then you follow into your next fiscal year and you put your strategic plan into effect, uh, at the end of or getting close to uh, the same time during that fiscal year, you'll want to go through the cycle again again for the, the upcoming fiscal year. So it's a continuous cycle. Michael, so that, yes. I, yeah, just one question, Gerald Ladd from SSC. I, I like your uh, your steps there in strategic planning. It's a, a beautiful slide. Uh, just a clarification in terms of the cost benefits that you need to go through in terms of the budgets, where would you see that fitting in that compendium? I know you well, need it there at the year end, going into the next year end, but would you do that somewhere in your risks and opportunity cycle? And sorry, this is the cost benefits? Yeah, the cost and benefit of continuing your yeah. work. And so that's a specific thing you have in the federal government, is it? Yes, in order to get your budget allocation. Right, right. So I, the thing is, I'm not, I'm not totally familiar with the, the process for cost benefits within the federal government, and how the federal government approves budgets uh, for the different organizations. So I, I'm not sure how well I'd be able to answer that question, and that's why I said that you have to take a look at your budgeting process to see how this might fit in there. Because yeah. if you have to do cost benefits uh, for, let's let's uh, say for example, for the objectives that you've set, uh, then you may have to do this a lot earlier on. Gerald, I think it might actually sort of fall in the gathering, uh, you know, the gathering data area, because that's going to be part of what goes into 
you know, a SWOT analysis or looking, you know, as you assess different opportunities, you know, what are the benefits to those things, right? So I'm right. thinking, it, you know, yeah, that's, again, that, uh, that's what I was thinking. You're going to start there, but when you get into the next year and you start this cycle over again, you're going to want to pick those things that you identified last year. And I mean, really, you know, that's going to be one of the things that you should be measuring through the year, right? I mean, but too exactly. often in the, gov in the government, people set these big cost benefit, uh, you know, statements at the very beginning of a project and until eight years later when it's actually delivered, do they actually go back and review it and say, should we keep continuing? Um, sometimes that happens, but not very often. OK, so let's take a look and, and just keep a, keep an eye out and let me know if you see as we're going through the rest of this presentation. If you see a place where that might actually happen or during this step when that might actually happen. So that first step gathering data is uh, actually called an environmental scan. And this is where you're gathering data uh, from all points of your organization uh, that will allow you to uh, get an idea of where your organization sits, uh, where your markets are, whether it's uh, private industry or government, uh, because you always have uh, clients or customers in certain markets, in certain geographic locations, uh, things internally and externally. Uh, for example, you might have, uh, as far as uh, the federal government goes, you might have uh, different objectives being set uh, above your organization, uh, guiding objectives or guiding policies. Uh, for private organizations, you might have those coming from uh, uh, the corporate level. You might have key performance indicators, key things that you measure within your organization. You find well, we want to be uh, at this level, but we're not. We're only halfway there. And so that might be uh, some information that you gather that might help the team to say later on, we should set an objective to increase uh, in that area because our key performance indicators uh, indicate that we're, uh, we're falling behind. You may have new and emerging technology. You want to bring this information in. Uh, you might you might want to look at your culture, uh, the level of knowledge within your organization. We're right in the middle, I think, of baby boomers retiring. So if any organization was uh, going to be thinking of strategic planning uh, uh, this year and next year, uh, they one of the uh, objectives might be to uh, increase the level of knowledge okay, within their corporation because there's, it's starting to leak. Uh, Management system standards, you might decide that you're going to implement this or implement that a quality management system, environmental management system. They might be uh, that they might determine a set objectives for the end of the year as well. And if you have been doing this for a while, then you would want to consider your previous year's strategic objectives and their status. So these the gathering data, the environmental scan, is to uh, uh, put together uh, a data package for the people who are going to be in on the strategic planning sessions that gives a good indication of where the organization is, uh, where it should be going, and how it's doing uh, getting there in the first place. Okay. Now, up in the top right-hand corner, you'll take a look at, the, there's a couple of elements from the ISO 9001 2015 standard. The first one is 4.1, understanding the organization, its context. This gather data, this gathering data step is completely all about understanding the organization, its context, and it will help you to completely meet that uh, element. The second one is the 5.2.1, establishing the quality policy. Well, the quality policy needs to be established in order to be uh, uh, part of this data package. So again, it would it would help to ensure that that is done. And 7.1.6 organizational knowledge. Well, you're gathering data, you're uh, you're getting together to determine uh, everything about the organization. That is a large part of organizational knowledge. So it's helping to 
to meet that uh, element as well. So one of the things within the uh, uh, environmental scan should be interested parties. And that is, if you take a look in the top right-hand corner again, that is 4.2 in the ISO 9001 standard, understanding the needs and expectations of interested parties. Now, the whole idea behind this is that used to be we would just focus on the customer and that's it. And yes, or the client, if you're in the in the federal government, the client. But it's not just about that uh, stakeholder. There are other stakeholders. Maybe that's the most important staker or almost the most important, but there are others that are also key. And you should be looking at uh, uh, them. And this causes you to have to create that list and understand what those needs and expectations of those other stakeholders are, like employees, like perhaps your partners, if you have uh, an organization that is directing you, including your suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. So again, having that, uh, that environmental scan, uh, and as you'll see in there, it talks about needs and expectations of relevant interests of parties. That's this one, interested parties and key stakeholders. So once you gather that uh, information package together and you, you, you organize it and you give it out to the team that's going to be meeting to determine what uh, the organization's uh, 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 strategic objective should be, then you hold a meeting. Or it's like a retreat, usually they hold a retreat. And one of the first steps within the retreat is called the SWOT analysis. And all the SWOT analysis is, is an organized brainstorm. And it's a brainstorm from the people that you feel are uh, most in the position that they, <clears throat> they're influential within the organization. Normally they're leaders, uh, but you may invite some other influential people. And these are people that know the most about the organization. They, uh, they are best suited uh, to uh, set the direction for the organization. And you do a brainstorming activity. So the whole thing about the SWAT is it's an acronym for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And these are the four things that you're going to ask people to brainstorm. Now, it's interesting to look at the, uh, the little uh, icon there, uh, SWAT, you'll see with the SW, it, it's all, it's pretty well in a uh, uh, a matrix where the strengths and the weaknesses, the S and the W, are internal, and the opportunities and the threats are external. So that when these these uh, groups of people are brainstorming, uh, they know what to look for. They're not just looking all over the place. They know okay, opportunities and threats. I need to think about external opportunities, external threats, not internal to the organization, etc. Also, when you take a look at the uh, columns for S and O, strengths and opportunities, those are things that are helpful to the organization. And the same thing with the W and the T, the weaknesses and the threats, those are the things that are harmful to the organization. So again, it helps with the SWAT. It helps uh, when they're brainstorming each of these categories to think the S, the strengths are internal and helpful. The opportunities are external and helpful. The weaknesses are internal and harmful, et cetera. And that helps them to brainstorm. So let's say you, you have this session, you have this retreat, you're doing the SWAT, which is essentially a brainstorming of all the things within the organization that represent their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. You throw them up on the different uh, flip charts. Uh, you ask people to add check marks to ones that are already there that they agree upon. Uh, because if, if you do that, then you'll start to see uh, some of the items that really have a lot of backing from the others as well. So here's where we come to where risk and opportunity ratings uh, to, pri to help prioritize comes into play. 
And you'll notice up in the top right hand corner, again, we have an ISO 9001 element called 6.1 actions to address risks and opportunities. Normally, when uh, you do a SWOT analysis and you've got you, you throw a whole bunch of stuff out there uh, as, in a brainstorm, you've got a lot of information, a lot of items, you need you always need to bring them down to a uh, a uh, an organizable uh, amount. You can't have 50 objectives. So you have to go back to the group and say, OK, which ones are we going to uh, select? And that takes a while. And so that's why we're using the risk and opportunity rating uh, process to prioritize rather than other ways, because you can actually, uh, uh, it, it helps you do it very quickly and you can meet one of the main elements of ISO 9001 at the same time. So keeping in mind, of course, that a risk is a potential for a loss, an opportunity is a potential for a gain. And that's it. The two are at odds to each other. Most strategies and plans entail both risk and opportunity, and as such, both play a role in decision making. So we want to avoid risks and we want to exploit opportunities. And you can already see where the language is very similar to helpful and harmful type of thing. Okay, these are opportunities, these are risks, and the language plays in the same way with the SWOT analysis. So here's the thing, and I've mentioned this a couple of times to people, whenever uh, I go looking for risk and opportunity uh, on Google, for example, because I want to find out how to do risk and opportunity ratings. And there's always examples of, OK, uh, here's an article about risk and opportunities and blah, blah, blah. And then they just start talking about risk. And that's it. Opportunities are forgotten completely. And I've seen this time and time and time again. So I had to develop uh, what is called a, 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 a mirrored matrix system for risk and opportunity. And if you take a look at the, uh, the risk rating matrix, they have one, two, three, four, five, going from the bottom left up to the uh, top right, where the, the five is a, a red, and the one is a green because risk is bad. So it gets a red. Low risk is good, so it gets a green. And if you take a look at the opportunity rating matrix, well, it's exactly opposite. Where five is green because opportunity is good and a low opportunity one is red because no opportunity is bad. OK, so they're exactly opposite to each other. But if you're looking at an opportunity and you're rating it a five, the numbering system is the same. If it's an extreme opportunity, I want to do something about it. And over in the risk rating matrix, if it's an extreme risk, I want to do something about it. So other than the fact that the colors are different, they're the same. So you can rate them the same way. The only difference is when you rate them. Both have uh, down at the bottom, an impact. But on the risk rating matrix, up the left hand side, that scale is called likelihood. How likely is it for that risk, that thing to happen? Well, that wouldn't be suitable for the opportunity rating matrix. So we had one going up the side that said ease of implementation. How easy would it be for that opportunity to be implemented? Both have the same bottom scale impact, but they each have different uh, side scales. OK, the big thing to remember is the rating system is the same. So when you get a high number five, those are the ones you go after. If you get a high number four, perhaps those are the ones you go after as well. So there's an activity. You rate the risk and opportunities from the SWAT. And remember, I said that the SWAT is a brainstorming activity. It's a whole bunch of stuff that goes out there. Uh, suggestions for objectives, so things that we need to uh, uh, take care of, things that we need to improve in or, or, or uh, 
take advantage of. And so you have a whole bunch out there, but you need to bring it down to a manageable lot. And that's why you rate them. You add the risks and opportunities identified in the SWOT analysis to the risk registry. Now, we don't have a picture of a risk registry here, but I think that uh, Kevin may be showing that uh, afterwards. I'm not sure, but he may. Uh, a risk registry and how that works in Qualaware, but a risk registry is really just a database. Okay, it notes the risk or the opportunity, uh, what the rating was, uh, what, what the actual description of it, uh, whether you need to do something about it if it has a high rating, and so on and so forth. Okay. So you determine the likelihood and the impact of risks or the ease of implementation, the impact of opportunities using the applicable rating matrices. Then you assign them ratings. So let's just imagine that we had all of those uh, suggestions or recommendations coming from the SWOT analysis, each of them rated. You've got a bunch of people around the table. They're not going to agree on everything, but they're going to have some sort of numbering system to be able to rate these things that are coming at them. They rate them and the formula is simple. You just take the average and you round it up, or you round it down. In this example, uh, there were there were four people. They went anywhere from a three to a five. They didn't have to argue. You know, there might be some discussion that causes some people to go up, some people to go down, but then you cut off the discussion because yeah, I have a lot of things to talk about. And then you have your final number. You divide it into the number of people. You have your average, and that's your number. So with risks and opportunity treatments, these are the things, the actions that you're going to take whenever you uh, determine what objectives you're going to have in the first place. And I'm, I'm going to just by the way, I'm going to be sending out a, a, a PDF document of all of these slides, so you're going to be able to access them later. OK, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but this is uh, these are the type of actions that you normally uh, uh, can take in order to reduce risk. In the case of an opportunity, usually you're just trying to increase that opportunity or take advantage of it. So let's go back to our strategic plan. We assigned objectives to our high rated risks and opportunities. You might have decided as a team we're only going to do fours and fives. There's no really no, no set rule, but you determine amongst yourselves what you're going to accept. And so let's say that out of that, we, we got a selection of about uh, four to six different objectives. And oh, by the way, there's no reason why you can't combine uh, the, uh, the recommendations for the SWOT analysis to make one objective, because there may be a bunch of similar ones. Something to take into consideration is how should you write a strategic objective, okay? And down at the bottom, it just shows a very simple uh, way to do it. It says action and detail and metric and unit and deadline. And this one, this example is for the private industry, but let's take a look at how we might be able to see it in the, in a public sector. Uh, in the private industry, expand our international operations into three new markets by December 21st, 2024. So they have a specific date that they have to do this by, that they're going to be monitoring. The measurable is three, and the thing is new markets. And what is it that they're going to do? They're going to expand, which means they're going to have more, not less, more. And the thing they're going to expand is their international operations. So on the public sector side, you might need to, it, it might be a fairly new unit, and they're starting to provide a service, but they haven't provided uh, in all areas where they could, and they might want to expand their service into three new, whatever you call it, if you call it a market or if you call it uh, a new jurisdiction by a certain date. Okay. The big thing is it has to be very, very clear for people to see and very, very simple for them to, uh, 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 to help them organize it into action. What should be included in these objectives? Well, you should have a description. 
an objective statement. Objective means everybody can see, read that statement and understand it the same way. You should have a method of measurement. Something that's very easy to measure. In this case, well, it says amount of sales, but in that it said amount of new markets. Uh, you should have a measurement owner. This is the person that's going to be responsible for monitoring uh, how well you're doing and meeting that objective. You should have a frequency. How often do you monitor that or how often do you update that, uh, uh, that measurement? You should have a baseline. In other words, where are we right now? And you should have a target. Where do we want to be by the time that we uh, uh, say that we're going to be finished with our objective, that we're going to meet our objective? These are the things that should be included. And here's an activity of completing the objectives. So number one, you determine the strategic objectives based on the rated risks and opportunities that came from the brainstorming that was the SWOT analysis. You assigned a focus area to each objective. Now watch your eyes and just going to go back for a second. What I mean by focus area is one of these. These are focus areas, learning and growth, internal business process, customer, financial. This could be just budget. It doesn't have to be financial. It could be something else if you're working in the government. Okay, so that's focus area. Number three is determine the method of measurement for each objective. Number four is determine the frequency. Number five is determine the measurement owner. Six, determine the baseline and target. And seven, review the results. If you're going to use the uh, uh, that methodology for your strategic planning, are the strategic objectives holistic or are they very narrow in scope? And after you do that, these are the next steps. You need to determine the initiatives to help you meet your corporate objectives. This is when you can determine uh, also how much you think it's going to cost. Uh, you should assign responsibilities and due dates to the initiatives. Uh, you should communicate these objectives and targets throughout the organization and encourage actions by employees because Otherwise, you're just relying on a small group to make these things happen. And you should monitor the results frequently. I would suggest monthly. You don't want to monitor them once annually uh, at the end of the year just to find out that you didn't meet it. Even quarterly, you know, it's not a lot of time for you to change direction if you need to. And then when you're finished, you complete the cycle and you start again same time each year. And uh, by the way, up top, we have a couple of more uh, uh, elements of the ISO standard that are help being met. Uh, 7.4 communication, and this is communicating this to all of the employees. And 9.1, monitoring measurement analysis and evaluation. And that was it. Thank you very much, Mike. Appreciate it. You're very welcome.